Now on BBC Two, Alan Clark tells how the man who took on the Nazis had to take on his own party first. The Conservative Party and the country were ill-equipped both physically and mentally for the Second World War. Winston Churchill, though, was utterly reinvigorated by the outbreak of hostilities. At the turn of the century, he had crossed the floor and joined the Liberal Party. Then in 1924, he had got himself back into the Conservative government, although the mass of the Tory party never forgave him. And he had spent most of the 30s goading them with the dangers and failure of their appeasement policy. For the last four years he had been crying wolf, and now the wolf had arrived. As the uh, Nazis look out tonight from their blatant, clattering, panoplied Germany, they cannot find one single friendly eye in the whole circumference of the globe. Not one! Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's position, on the other hand, was an uncomfortable one. Could he continue to lead the party and the country when many saw the outbreak of war as a direct consequence of his appeasement policy? As the country prepared for battle, Chamberlain had to finesse a particularly difficult hand. Churchill's newfound popularity meant he had to be given a job. But he was a difficult ally. Chamberlain made Churchill first Lord of the Admiralty, then busied himself in setting up an administrative structure that would make it difficult and laborious for him to bother other ministers. First, dig a pit four feet deep. Then, build your shelter inside it. This meant every operational issue had to be tackled three times. By the Chiefs of Staff, then by the Military Coordination Committee, and then by the War Cabinet. For the first few months, neither side shot at the other. It was the period of the phony war. For Churchill to attain the Premiership, the conflict had to be widened, and he devised a scheme for blocking the German shipping routes to Norway. But Hitler beat him to it and invaded first. The campaign was a disaster. And on the 11th of April 1940, the Conservative government faced a no-confidence motion on the floor of the House of Commons. Churchill was on a knife edge. On one side, the abyss, a scapegoating dismissal for his ill-judged and impetuous extravagance in lives and material. On the other, a political opportunity that could never be repeated. All through the debate, there were people trying to cast flies over him. Don't, uh, said Lloyd George, make yourself, allow yourself to be made an air raid shelter for the government. Uh, and other people made similar suggestions that he was the man. But uh, he wouldn't flinch for an instance. And he made the most wonderful, powerful speech uh, at the end. Uh, he said that all the strong parties all the strong horses pull at the collar, let party rancor be forgotten. It was tremendous stuff. And uh, I sat there after the division was called in my chair doing nothing until I saw the speaker rise to, to say lock the doors. And at that stage something with my guts made me move into the uh, anti-government lobby. And I was one of about 30 MPs on the conservative side who took that line. In the event, uh, Neville Chamberlain won by 81 votes. The government was crippled, but not defeated. 
And I thought I'd got the worst of all possible worlds. And I went back to Lincolnshire with my tail between my legs, thinking that everything had gone wrong. But it hadn't. The government may have won the motion, but it had plainly and humiliatingly lost the confidence of the House of Commons. Chamberlain's position was now untenable. What was to happen? Churchill would have been the popular choice in the country, but the Conservatives neither liked him nor trusted him, and the establishment preference was for Edward Earl Halifax, Chamberlain's foreign secretary and co-architect of the appeasement policy. The Conservative Party would have preferred my father, and I think that he would have been uh, many, a, a very popular choice. There was a certain amount of, uh, uh, well, I mean, there was great respect for Winston Churchill, but there was a certain amount of alarm about his being leader. The choice lay between Halifax and Churchill, and uh, quite rightly, Halifax said that as a member of the House of Lords, he couldn't lead a government in wartime, and uh, Churchill was left to learn and remained silent and was made Prime Minister, and that is how we came to win the war. This is, of course, a received version, but I believe that Halifax, an astute politician, had his own agenda, and he was playing it long. He believed that in the end he would be called in to pick up the pieces anyway. First, Churchill had to be given enough rope and seen to make a mess of things. On the 10th of May, 1940, Winston Churchill went to Buckingham Palace to be made Prime Minister. This was for Churchill his complete and heroic apotheosis. But politically, his position was very far from secure. As far as the Conservative Party was concerned, he was on probation, and he knew it. As Lord Davidson wrote to Stanley Baldwin, the Tories don't trust Winston. After the first clash of war is over, it may well be that a sounder government will emerge. When Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940, for the first few times that he was in the chamber, the only chairs, the most chairs, came from the Labour side and not from the Conservative side. And this is quite right, because large numbers of them resented the displacement of Chamberlain and, uh, and regarded Churchill with some apprehension, with a good deal of apprehension. Within two weeks of Churchill becoming Prime Minister, France was on the point of surrender, and the only thing between Hitler and London was 25 miles of the English Channel. Was this going to be the shortest premiership in our history. I remember my father saying, look at that view down there. Can you imagine how awful it would be if you had Germans strutting round there, uh, knowing that they'd beaten us? That was the prospect that he talked to me about in the summer of 1940. My father felt, and I think others, felt with him that there might be something to be said for examining the possibility of some cessation of hostilities so that we could live again in a normal state of affairs. On the 28th of May, Halifax recommended to the War Cabinet that the Italians might be invited to arbitrate a settlement. Churchill realised at once what this meant. Once you talk about terms, you are effectively committed to a ceasefire. And once an armistice was agreed, Churchill's premiership would be finished. Churchill was outnumbered in the war camp. What could he do? He suspended the sitting. He got in all the ministers of state and addressed them. I am convinced, he said, that every man of you would rise up and tear me down from my place if I were for one moment to contemplate parley or surrender. 
If this Long Island story of ours is to end at last, let it be only when each one of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. When Cabinet came back that evening, it was over. There would be no talks. Talks at this stage would have been little different from defeat in battle. The Germans could have imposed on us anything that they wished. And this is Churchill's great achievement. He saved us less than two and a half weeks into his premiership. No one else could have done that. As soon as he was established as Prime Minister, Churchill began a shift in power and responsibility, away from the traditional high Tories. Churchill had brought Lord Beaverbrook into the cabinet. Against the wishes and advice of many, including quite specifically and highly unconstitutionally King George VI, who will have remembered the support that Beaverbrook's newspapers gave to his brother Edward VIII, most people, behind his back at least, referred to him as the beaver, except for Halifax, who called him the toad. And so I beg all of you, everywhere, to speed the tank, speed the defences of Britain, speed the hour when we can say to every soldier who's waiting and wanting tank equipment, we have provided you with what you require. Oh my goodness me, I've been to Turkey, his house in the country, and I've sat up till three in the morning waiting for him to have news of how many fighters or how many planes were needed the next day when he was Minister of Aircraft Production. And then he used to ring up the factories and say, I've got to have six more planes tomorrow. Well, of course, there was no possibility of having six more planes tomorrow. But he went on and on and on. He was absolutely wonderful and relentless. In August of 1940, the Germans started their all-out air attack on Britain. Lying on the lawn, on the terrace, with champagne beside me and a pair of race glasses, watching the Battle of Britain. And watching the German planes going in formation and the English planes, fighter planes going round and round and shoot, trying to shoot them down. And the, the lawn scattered when the machine gun caps I mean, the lawn had to be swept of machine gun caps because, and I had a pile this high, and I said to the gardener, let's keep them, they're very romantic. Now Churchill had an extraordinary stroke of luck when, at almost the same time, two key vacancies opened. In November, Neville Chamberlain died. And Churchill, although the leader nominally of a coalition government, moved fast and against, incidentally, the advice of his wife, who hated the Conservative Party, to become anointed as its leader. Then, four weeks later, our ambassador in Washington died and Halifax, to the accompaniment of much bogus protestation about how important the post had become, found himself forced into accepting banishment. My mother felt so strongly that she said to my father, I want to go and see Winston with you and talk about this. And she apparently uh, went and had a say. And Winston Churchill listened very politely and um, attentively to what she said. And eventually she said, no, I'm afraid I must stick to my, my proposition that Edward should go to America as our ambassador. And so it was decided. Churchill moved into his new headquarters in a bunker under Whitehall. He was now politically secure for the time being, and our military prowess had been reasserted by brilliant victories over the Italians in North Africa. Hitler recognized military stalemate in the West, 
wanted to attack Russia before she became too strong, and in any event, wanted to keep the British Empire in being as a counterweight in the Far East. These were all respectable Tory objectives. Hitler wanted to do a deal, and his deputy, Rudolf Hess, appointed himself unofficial ambassador. And so, on the night of the 10th of May, Hess flew himself to Scotland, solo, an extraordinary feat of navigation, and he brought with him the peace terms in the expectation that they would be put before the full war cabinet. But there is no evidence that they were examined or even referred to in this room. And all the key documents relating to this episode have either been destroyed or are still classified so highly secret that no one is allowed to look at them. Churchill wanted to continue the war, but he had no strategic plan for winning it other than by enlisting the United States. Although there was no possibility of Roosevelt bringing America into the war unprovoked. Why the thumbs up? Because the American lease and lend bill is now showing results. At many ports in Britain, the tools to finish the job are arriving in healthy quantities. The things we need most in our fight for freedom. Partly to ingratiate himself, partly to cope with the hugely increasing dollar debt for arms, Churchill traded off British gold, foreign shareholdings, patents and other assets, starting with the notorious destroyer deal, when the whole of the British West Indies was ceded in exchange for 50 obsolete World War I destroyers. By the middle of 1941, Britain had been stripped of all her assets and had become little more than an American mercenary, a status which she was to suffer for the next 40 years. And still the United States had not entered the war. The King was appalled and wrote to Halifax in Washington. But what good was that? In party terms, there was no one in the war cabinet who could or dared protest, although Beaverbrook occasionally had a shot at it. Churchill had so ordered things that the Chancellor of the Exchequer did not even sit in on economic decisions when they came before war cabinet until most of the damage had been done. Churchill also made a huge strategic error. He committed all our strength to Greece and left the Far East virtually defenseless. Spring 1942, military disaster in Singapore was followed by a series of defeats. But these catastrophes had a wider long-term implication for Britain. Once we had been beaten by the Japanese, we lost our credibility as colonial rulers. A fatal blow had been struck to a role that traditional Tories saw as crucial. Once again, as the fortunes of war turned against Britain, the mutterings in the party against Churchill grew. All through 1942, the miserable defeats accumulated, even at sea. And it became a race between an eruption in the parliamentary party and the arrival of good news from the desert. And then in the nick of time, Montgomery broke through at Almay and Zhukov at Stalingrad. Heads forth, Churchill's position as leader was impregnable. Victory. A, a remarkable and definite victory. A bright gleam has caught the helmets of our soldiers and warmed and cheered all our hearts. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. 
In fact, the cost, both to the country and to the party, was horrendous. As well as being broke, the social order at home was disintegrating. And socialist planning was actually being introduced by the government. Rationing, direction of labor, bureaucracy. All this had become part of the war effort. While the Red Army, by its exploits, was making communism respectable, even glamorous. Churchill showed no interest in planning for the post-war future, for the party or the country. This neglect was epitomized by the Beveridge Report. Its wide-ranging proposals for an extended welfare state gripped the popular imagination, while the Tories fudged and fumbled. Churchill, who had been so committed to war, seemed almost to be bored by the prospect of peace. Eight weeks later, the British electorate went to the polls for the first time in ten years. For the sake of the country and of your own happiness, I call upon you to march with me under the banner of freedom towards the beacon lights of national prosperity and honor, which must ever be our guide. As I was canvassing, people again and again said, we want a Labour government, but we want Winston Churchill as Prime Minister. And uh, I, I sort of raised my eyebrows and said, but that's the one thing you can't add. What, they said, isn't this a free country? <laughs> of course, there were no polls in those days to guide people as to how the campaign was going. And uh, we just felt in the Conservative Party that it was inconceivable that Winston would be thrown out after winning the war. On the 26th of July 1945, Lord Rothermere gave a party here in the Dorchester to celebrate the inevitable Conservative victory in the general election. The school holidays had just started and I came here with my father. As we came up the stairs, we were almost bowled over by Viscount Moore rushing down them. White as a sheet, he said, it's a landslide, a landslide. He and Brendan Bracken were bosses of the Financial Times, and he was heading back to the city to sell the market. When we got into the room, we found that most of the guests had already left, and the atmosphere was sepulchral. Why did the Tories lose the election of 1945 so catastrophically? Politicians always prefer the easy and obvious answer and ignore the long-term trends of public opinion. But the Conservatives were associated with brutal unemployment. The Socialists seemed to promise a job for all, and with the beverage welfare state, a hospital bed for all also. Materially, the upper classes were not hit as hard by the Labour government as they pretended. Bentley cost four times the manufacturer's list price on the black market, yet by 1947 five, all owned by Conservative MPs, could be counted in the House of Commons car park. The real deprivation was the severance of that link 
between the administration and the upper class, which had always in former times allowed the socially prominent, who had a personal problem or an opinion to air, to operate the old boy network. Leave it to me, I'll get hold of, for example, Oliver. This linkage was no longer operational. The party, for the first time in the 20th century, was effectively cut off from power. In opposition, Churchill rarely had very little to do with the Conservative Party. He was on a Nazi's yacht. He was writing his histories. He stood in an almost regal position in relation to the country as a whole. He sometimes described himself, which annoyed Conservatives very much, as being above the contest. But to the chagrin of some members of the party, whatever his behaviour, Churchill's personal popularity with the electorate rendered him politically indispensable. As invariably happens, when a party feels itself to be the subject of total rejection by the electorate, the solution is seen to lie in assuming as close a resemblance as possible to one's opponents. The post-war consensus was not simply about the desirability of government intervention at every level of a citizen's activity. Wartime economic planning and Keynesian theory had come up with two ideas whose general acceptance was regarded as inseparable from political success but which were to retard post-war Britain until the advent of Margaret Thatcher. First, that full employment was permanently sustainable. Second, that deficit financing was the way to manage the economy. Any Conservative government would accept as one of their primary aims and responsibilities the maintenance of a high and stable level of employment. <coughs> By 1951, the Labour government had become a disappointment to the electorate. Rationing, housing shortage, bureaucracy, it all seemed as bad as the war. But this didn't change the faith in the post-war consensus. It just made the electorate feel that Labour weren't very good at management. What was the Conservative voter of 1951 like? Increasing taxation meant that the middle classes and upwards anyone, that is, with something to lose, was voting Conservative. In spite of the cold, Piccadilly Circus was almost as crowded as on victory night. It was a friendly crowd, and as the scoreboard flashed up the first results, nothing fiercer than boos or cheers indicated where their sympathies lay. At the Conservative headquarters, Lord Walton, the party chairman, stood by the tape machines as the agency flashes told him of a Conservative majority in the making. As result crowded upon result, a swing to the right became apparent, a win for the Conservatives, with Mr Churchill back again as Prime Minister. establishment were uh, very dubious about uh, Winston. They had to they had to put up with him anyway, of course, and they were happy to have his uh, wartime prestige on their side. But they strongly distrusted, distrusted his uh, instincts. Churchill had been traumatized by the results of the general election of 1945. Now he was Prime Minister again, his attitude to the trade unions was one of consistent appeasement. He and Walter Monckton replicated the Chamberlain-Halifax double act of the 30s and the consequences were almost as damaging. Labour relations in general were very, very important to Churchill. Uh, he was convinced that this was his uh, Achilles heel 
that uh, they would bring him down unless he was extremely conciliatory. And he appointed the most conciliatory man he could find in the United Kingdom, Sir Walter Monckton, as Minister of Labour. And he gave him pretty strict riding instructions, which were always to give way every time. Is he in? Ah, good morning, Mr. Kite. Uh, well, he's very busy, but I know he's always pleased to see you. <clears throat> uh, will you come this way? Ah, come in. Take a pew. Cigarette? After due deliberation, Major Hitchcock, the Works Committee has had to call a stoppage in response to our members' wishes. Oh, really? Well, what precisely is the trouble? The members feel that the agreement negotiated with respect to time and motion study is being contravened. Oh, that's impossible, you know me. I wouldn't do anything behind the backs of the unions. Churchill may not have been a natural conservative, but his deputy was. Anthony Eden was glamorous, charismatic and ambitious. He was the Foreign Secretary, the party darling, and Churchill's heir apparent. He had known Anthony Eden for the whole of Eden's life. And he admired him tremendously. They'd been through the 1930s together and all the history of appeasement and Munich. And he, I always think he really regarded Eden as a, a child, a son. I saw him first when I was about 16, and uh, this figure came in, <laughs> dressed in this wonderful bottle green tweed jacket and bottle green pinstriped tweed trousers, which was an uh, sort of amazing idea. I, I remember writing something on the road about his sock. He used to put his feet on the table in the House of Commons and his socks were very prominent. And I, I think I said something about it. People are going to put their feet on the table. They need to choose their socks more carefully. Well, I mean, that's the sort of thing journalists say, no hard feelings. But I think he took it rather amiss. The relationship between the boss and his deputy, particularly when it is assumed that the deputy may take over at any moment, is always difficult. Eden's speciality was foreign affairs. And in particular, he was highly sceptical of the United States' attitude towards Britain. This irritated Churchill, who by now was interested only in the field of international diplomacy. He became determined that Eden should not succeed him. And soon this was to become an obsession. One of the world stages that Churchill saw as his own was the European one. And here we may detect the seeds of the schizophrenia on this topic that has affected the Tory party for the rest of the century. Actually, Churchill was in favour very much of, 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 of European unity, uh, as he saw it. And he was very much in favour of reconciliation he, uh, after a war, and therefore bringing Germany back into the Western community. And of course, he was very. He had a very great affection for France. So, very much Germany, France come together. But Churchill himself never saw us as being members of it. He saw us as a sort of uh, godmother, godfather, you know, sort of, uh, uh, or, 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 or even the best man taking the French. It was all part of Franco-German reconciliation. So, taking them to the altar and getting the blessing. And uh, if you're in trouble, let me know. In 1952, the divorced Eden married Churchill's niece, Clarissa. But Anthony had kept his engagement secret from Winston and Clementine Churchill until a week before the wedding. An indication, perhaps, that the Prime Minister's relationship with his foreign secretary was no longer as close as it might have appeared to be. My unfortunate aunt had just gone off on a well-earned holiday to Capri. And as um, Anthony had insisted on everything being kept secret, we hadn't even told them. So suddenly this bombshell descended on her and she had to come <laughs> rushing back to organize the reception. 
Churchill told Clarissa that he wanted to retire and that Antony must be gentle with him. But Churchill wasn't very gentle with Eden. He once minuted his Minister of Health, saying he was increasingly worried about myxomatosis. Do you think Antony might catch it? In March of 1953, Stalin died. Stalin and Churchill were the two great war leaders of the 20th century, and Stalin would probably have been quite content to be remembered just as that, a true hero of the Soviet Union. But Churchill, with his greater sense of history, wanted to see his achievement crowned as being the great peacemaker also. Utterly unrealistic, of course, but it did offer a convincing reason for postponing once again Eden's claim to the succession. He did have the very rational and noble idea that uh, he was the sort of man who could make a proper peace with a proper agreement with the Soviet Union. I think he was wrong. I think they thought he was nothing but a wicked old warmongering capitalist. But nevertheless, he thought that, that was, he was well suited for it and that it was his mission. And besides, Richard kept him as Prime Minister and kept Eden out of the job for a bit longer. So it might perhaps have entered his mind occasionally. Queen Elizabeth was crowned on the 2nd of June, 1953. Four weeks later, Churchill had a stroke. His movements were affected. He could hardly walk, and his speech was slurred. But still, he would not leave office. Medical bulletins were issued by Lord Moran, stating that Churchill was to have a rest because he'd become very overtired by the coronation. And he was to have two months rest. And what was so extraordinary was that the press accepted this. I think it shows the influence of the press barons who were friends of Churchill, personal friends. There was Lord Beaverbrook and, and the Express Group and Lord Camrose was a very close friend who was the proprietor of the Daily Telegraph. They were consulted not only because of their influence and the importance of uh, putting whatever, to use contemporary parlance, whatever spin they could on things publicly, and the fact that the Prime Minister just vanished for, or virtually vanished for two months, was, was not going to be the easiest thing to disguise if the press chose to take notice of it. Um, but also because they, they were, I think, regarded as friends of his, and, and, I, and, and I think they were rather loyal to him as individuals. Um, I don't think there's anything like that now. I'm, into the, I'm not saying it couldn't happen again. The Daily Telegraph has always had an intimate and at times tempestuous relationship with the Conservative Party. But however supportive the press were in 1953, if Churchill couldn't deliver the conference speech, he would be forced to resign. One word personally about myself. If I stay on for the time being, bearing the burden at my age, it is not because of love for power or office. I have had an ample share of both. If I stay, it is because I have a feeling that I may two things that have happened, have an influence on what I care about above all else, the building of a sure and lasting peace. I sometimes used to think that Churchill was being a little bit naughty. He was playing a slight game of pat ball with Eden because he knew, he, he knew Eden wanted to take the premiership. And it was a tease. It was rather a naughty tease in some ways. And the Foreign Office was quite often at loggerheads in number 10. In June 1954, while Churchill was in the United States visiting Eisenhower, both Eden and Macmillan wrote to him saying he should resign. 
Churchill took it badly, telling his doctor that the party would not want to let the country down for the short-term convenience of Eden. It is not, he said, as if I was making way for a strong young man. This was inflicting great damage on the Conservative Party. Uncertainty, the postponement of much initiative, a feeling that even the outcome of the next election could be in jeopardy. Of course, they had been tremendously close, you know, for so many years, and particularly during the war when they were working hand in glove the whole time. Um, and um, therefore, it took a great deal to have any antagonism between them. But uh, as, you know, Winston was continually saying he was going to resign and then changing his mind, it obviously became rather trying, not only for Anthony, but for the cabinet too, I think. Churchill's 80th birthday was celebrated in November of 1954. Still, he would not resign. When Eden tried to convince him that his time was due, it will all be yours before you are 60, replied Churchill. Why are you in such a hurry? Well, Anthony confided in me about his frustration, but I certainly wasn't the only one. He was confiding in everybody, practically anybody who came to dinner, uh, felt the full blast, of, uh, particularly if he just had a rough passage with the old man who just cancelled another date for a time. <laughs> Um, whoever was at the dinner table got the full force of it, and that was probably the sole conversation. On the 5th of April 1955, after changing his mind at least eight times, Churchill finally stood down in favour of Anthony Eden. Describing his resignation afterwards, Churchill said, no two men have ever changed guard more smoothly. Initially, the portents were good. The party rallied behind its glamorous new leader for the 1955 general election campaign. When we got to Glasgow, we got into the sort of Gorbals district and the dockside and all that. And um, there were all these uh, men in, you know, the cloth caps, which were traditionally worn then, all swarming round and saying, you know, good on you. and. Um, keep to it. And I hadn't quite realised how extraordinary that was, in fact, when you think of what Glasgow must be like now, as regards to the Conservatives. He'd always been the golden boy. He'd never known really adverse criticism. He'd never been in the doghouse in politics. Uh, he resigned at the right moment uh, from uh, Neville Chamberlain's government. He came back at the right moment in Winston's government. And so he'd always been the golden boy. He was almost like a pop star in a way for the older women. We used sometimes to travel by train and at every platform that we stopped, there used to be groups of women in their 50s and 60s with bunches of flowers in their hands. And Anthony Eden would push the window down in the carriage and they would thrust all these flowers through the window to him so that uh, he said to me once, are we going to a wedding or a funeral? We'll find out on polling night, won't we? And so it proved. Sir Anthony Eden's party had been chosen by the country. Their increased majority fully endorsed their policies. Now it's up to everyone in the land to work for peace and for the prosperity of Britain under the Premier's leadership. I can only say to you, thank you for all you've done. Good luck. Eden's honeymoon was very short. Within a year, he was caught up in a major international crisis when Colonel Nasser, the president of Egypt, nationalized the Suez Canal. In the 1930s, Eden had been the youngest foreign secretary until he resigned in protest at the appeasement policy. Now he drew the analogy between Nasser and Hitler thus demonstrating that tendency of leaders to follow always policies designed to prevent the last war. Our quarrel is not with him, still less for the out of work. It is with Colonel Nasser, with dictators who always have to pay a higher price 
later on. For their appetite grows with feeding. When the telephone rang, this was Anthony. Will you not understand, and if you don't understand, come to the cabinet and explain why. And will you tell your people in the Foreign Office that I want NASA destroyed. I don't want him neutralized. Eden fixed up a secret deal with the French and Israeli government. Israel invaded Egypt, then France and Britain went in, ostensibly to keep the peace. And he actually lied to the House of Commons when he said, in so many words, there was no foreknowledge of the Israeli attack. Of course there was. Not only foreknowledge, there was foreplanning and everything. Eden's catastrophic blunder was not the covert operation itself, but his failure to get American backing for it. Because ever since Winston Churchill had drained our war chest in 1941, it was economically impossible for Britain to do anything without American consent. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. We do not accept the use of force as a wise or proper instrument for the settlement of international disputes. And as soon as the news of the airborne landings reached them, the Americans started offloading sterling on the world currency markets. The American government kept up the pressure on the pound. The Conservative Chancellor was by now Mr. Harold Macmillan, always a man with an eye to the main chance, and he told Eden that in a few days we would be bust. Untrue, as it happens. But the troops were withdrawn without exacting any concessions. Eden had a nervous breakdown and went to Jamaica to recuperate. His political career was finished. The main thing I'm feeling is that I'm deeply sorry to have to leave the country at this time. But uh, I'm going because the doctors say I must. I mean, I see Eden now in retrospect as a tragic figure. Never fulfills potential. Or when he did, it was too late. And then finally caught in the one area where you would have expected him to know what he was doing. He went to war with NASA in order to, to topple NASA because he didn't think that the world was frankly big enough to hold the two of them. And that one or other had to go. And as it turned out, it was Anthony who went, not NASA. The Suez Crisis was the first global illustration of the truth that the foreign exchange markets are more powerful than an amphibious task force. This debacle took away the party's confidence in foreign affairs and was to inhibit Britain acting independently of the United States until the Falklands War. The Conservative Party, whose raison d'etre was the nation state and whose core ethic was patriotism, now found itself forced to confront the reality of Britain's ebbing power in the new world order. And yet the irony is that the seeds of Britain's decline had been planted long ago by the action and inaction of that one leader who above all others the party had elevated to the status of a patriotic hero, Winston Churchill. <laughs> All change again for the Tories next week on BBC Two. Losing the election in 74 meant a new face for the party. Alan Clark continues his history at the earlier time of 10 past eight.